Good evening. I told Wayne he had nothing to worry about. But... It's funny how quickly time uh, flies ahead of you. This has nothing to do with our lesson, but I was just thinking uh, this morning's we had Bo's birthday yesterday, and uh, but today is his actual birthday, and Jill and I woke up this morning and she said, I just didn't think we would have a two-year-old already. <laughs> Um, but the funny thing is, uh, we haven't known about him for two whole years yet. That'll be the 15th. That's when we uh, were first told about him and when we ended up first taking custody of him. So uh, that'll be a full two years for us being with Bo. Uh, this evening, I thought that we might start with a fun little phrase. Use your nose. That's what we're going to be talking about tonight. How do we use our nose as it pertains to the Bible. Uh, before I, I, I dig in here, uh, David McWilliams and I talked after my lesson this morning, um, and I did want to point out what we talked about with 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, it's not that that verse completely takes the idea of cessationism off the table in that verse. I wanted to be clear about that, um, that they're, they, they do go together, uh, but that just wasn't what we were talking about this morning. So I did want to make that clear. David was uh, wise enough to point that out to me, and hey, maybe you should say something uh, tonight. So thank you, David, for helping me with that. But um, uh, all right, so how do we use our nose? Well, I, I got this idea. In high school, I took a forensics class, uh, like the actual scientific forensics class, not speech and debate. Um, and my teacher, Mrs. Renberg, uh, gave us an assignment. It was quite an interesting assignment. Um, but she had raw pig's feet. Um, she had seven of them. Uh, maybe she ate the eighth one, I don't know. But there were seven of them. And about a week or maybe ten days ahead of time, she hid these feet all around the campus of my high school. And my campus sat on about 80 acres. So she hid them all around. We had a, a creek and forested area and everything all is part of our, uh, of our campus. So we had quite a bit of ground to cover, but we had, so she put them out about a week in advance and we had a week to find them. And the only thing we could use was our nose. And we were in groups of four, I think, and we were going around our entire campus for a week trying to find these pig's feet. And there, was, there were a few lessons that Ms. Renberg was trying to teach us, but probably the lesson I learned the strongest was I will never forget that smell. The way that that smells, if, if you didn't know, um, not everything degrades with the same kind of smell, but pigs and humans, because of our very similar DNA structure, we actually smell extremely similar, more similarly than any other animal when it comes to our decaying bodies. And so when you smell that smell, uh, chances are there's only a few things that that could be. And I, I'm always going to remember that smell. And I just always associate it with, it's the smell of death to me. Um, and sometimes you can smell it a little bit if you're driving down the highway or, or whatever, but I, I'm, just, I'm always going to remember it. But it was a very striking lesson for me. Um, and as I started thinking, I've, I've told the story before of picking weeds with my father and, and him asking me, uh, or instructing me that I should always look for spiritual lessons in the things that I'm doing in my life. So I remember we were just out in the middle of, uh, of the woods on our high school campus, and I just thought, what am I, what am I going to take from this in a spiritual context? How am I going to think about this on a spiritual plane? And honestly, it took me longer than I care to admit to figure out what the, uh, what the, the lesson was for me. And I realized that once we, it comes down to here, once we remember the smell, that never goes away. I always will know what that smell is. 
And it, it struck me, why don't I always know what spiritual death smells like? Why is it that sometimes I come upon this putrid, festering sin and I don't see it for what it truly is? This horrible, disgusting thing that serves no purpose other than to make me ill. And as I sat there and and thought about that, then I realized, well, how do I first learn what that smell is. How do I know what that smell is? Have you ever tried to describe a smell to someone? Do you realize how hard that is? Because you usually have to use other smells to try to, to tell somebody what it smells. The easiest thing to do is you go, okay, you smell that, that's what it is. It's the easiest thing to do. Uh, I, I thought for a long time I knew what a skunk smelled like, and then I finally smelled a skunk, and I realized I never knew what a skunk actually smelled like. It's that kind of thing. It's when you try to describe things to people that we don't use our words for, it's very difficult, like trying to describe a color to a blind person. It's so difficult to do. You have to talk about all these other sensations. But the beautiful thing about our spiritual selves is God tells me exactly what I should expect. I know exactly what I'm looking for. I know exactly what's going to drive me away from him. If I smell like that, God wants nothing to do with me. If you'll turn with me to Psalm 1 and 2, I think we're going to start figuring this out. Psalm 1. We're going to read both 1 and 2. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of Yahweh, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yield its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does he prospers. The wicked are not so. They are like chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For Yahweh knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Why are the nations in an uproar, and the people devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against his anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. Yahweh scoffs at them. He will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of Yahweh. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now, therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship Yahweh with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son that he may not become angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. I know what I should be avoiding. I know what my life should look like, or in this case, perhaps smell like, if I am paying attention to what God has told me, Psalm 1 verse 2, his delight is in the law of Yahweh, and in his law he meditates day and night. Verse 6, Yahweh knows the way of the righteous. Psalm 2 11, worship Yahweh with reverence, Rejoice with trembling, do homage to the Son. How blessed are all who take refuge in Him. When I have made God my refuge, then I know, I know what, how all of this works. And it's one thing to say, well, that's what God thinks, but what if I don't agree with God? There are certain things in this life that are just true. 
that when God is telling us this, but we can see it for ourselves. I've always found it interesting, the things that uh, I can uh, agree on, moralistic stances that I agree upon with people that have no religious background whatsoever. It's always humorous to me. Because I sit there and say, we know these things from the depth of our heart. Of course, they don't understand God designed us that way. God put that within us. But there are things that we know. We know that those things are wrong, just like we can sit there and say, if I, if I smell something, I can tell you if it's edible or not. Sometimes that's the way this world works. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Jesus is wrapping up the Sermon on the Mount. If you look with me in verse 24, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great was its fall. If you actually look at uh, a lot of media that we have today, a lot of entertainment that we have today, what you'll actually find is a lot of what Jesus says in his ministry are things that are upheld by others in our culture and in our society. Uh, things like being nice to people, being forgiving of other people, being humble with people. These are all things that we will uphold and say these are good and honorable things. And then when you ask them why they're good and honorable things, they have a hard time telling you why. But they still get it. Right? It's kind of like I'm either going to sniff one of these pig's feet that's been out for two weeks, or I'm going to smell a rose. I guarantee you one smells better than the other. And you don't have to have smelled the pig's feet to know which one it is. Sometimes we know what the good and right things are. There are certain good and right things that are obvious to us. And here, Jesus says that when we follow what he has told us, then it is wisdom. Did you notice that? Maybe compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. When we are paying attention to what Jesus has told us, we know that we have nothing with us but things that are sweet smelling. We have things that are good to God. Not whether or not I think it's good, but that God thinks it's good. So we have to listen to what God has to say. We have to listen to what Jesus has to say. And we need to be focused on worshiping God. If we turn with me to Daniel, to the book of Daniel... Daniel 1 and Daniel chapter 6 have two very similar things that are said about Daniel. If you look with me at Daniel 1, we're going to go a, a little bit earlier um, to uh, verse 5. The king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank and appointed that they should be educated three years at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. Now among them from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them, and to Daniel he assigned the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. 
So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. So one, I, I find it interesting the way the New American Standard reads it, which is that Daniel made up his mind. Uh, but one of the things that uh, is spoken of, if you know some Hebrew, is that there is a, uh, there's a connotation to that phrase in Hebrew, which is that he made up his mind from a very early age. He made up his mind from a very early age, which from what we have a, a general understanding of, Daniel is a young, very young man at this time, perhaps uh, late teens into his early 20s here. But he made up his mind at a young age that he would not defile himself. If you look over at chapter 6, here in Daniel chapter 6, Daniel has, has had a, a few decades of experience under his belt at this point. And there is this injunction that has been signed by Darius or Darius um, that uh, you could only worship the king. You can't worship any other uh, god or else you'd be cast into the lion's den. Verse 10, when Daniel knew the document was signed, he entered his house. Now in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem and he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God, as he had been doing previously. And that phrase there, as he had been doing previously, is the idea that he's been doing this for quite some time. This is a regular thing that Daniel has done. And even though he's in a new situation, he's in a new place, he has new considerations he made up his mind a long time ago to continue doing the things that are sweet-smelling to God. And it's a, it's a very easy platitude to say, well, this is just God, right? This is what God thinks, and, and, and what if I don't agree with God? But when we search deep within ourselves, we know that these things are true. And they're held all the more true by what Jesus tells us. We know that what the Bible tells us is full of truth. But one of the ways that we know is by experience. We know that when we act and behave in the ways that God says are sweet smelling to him, that are the proper ways to behave, to perform under pressure, that those are the times where life has gone all the better for us. God has proven himself in our life that he knows exactly what he's talking about. And one of the better examples, I think, is the Sermon on the Mount. And as you look through the Sermon on the Mount, there's a lot of things that Jesus has to say. There's a reason why this is uh, his longest discourse in the Gospels. But he has a lot of things to say. But as we stop along the way at each one, for instance, verses 3 through 12 of chapter 5, and we see the, what we call the Beatitudes there. As we look and, and uh, we realize how each of these can be effective in our own life, and a lot of them are, they, they are counterintuitive to our human way of thinking. But as we decide to do these in our own lives, they become all the more apparent why God sets these on a pedestal. Being poor in spirit, right? The idea of being humble. When you are humble, it's a far better time for you. Jesus has a parable that he, uh, that he gives later on about uh, sitting at a feast, if you decide that you're going to puff up your chest and sit at a higher table, you might be asked to go sit at the last table. Or if you decide that I deserve to be at this lowest table, then you might be moved up to a higher table. Uh, there's a restaurant in Graham where Jill and I just moved from, and it's a, an Italian, they say it's an Italian proverb, uh, but it, it says it's worse to pay too little. And it, it goes into a, a detailed explanation of why if you, if you pay too much, then it will be repaid to you, either giving your money back or it will be repaid to you in kindness. But if you pay too little, then more will be required of you later. 
And these ideas are what we, we understand at a basic level. Blessed are those who mourn. We all know that when we are mournful rather than when we are happy, things can be in a, in a better perspective for us. Blessed are the gentle. If all you're doing is constantly fighting and being at odds with one another, then conflict is all you'll have for the rest of your life. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. That one's a little harder for us to truly understand, I think. But uh, how, how much better is it to hunger and thirst for something that is eternal, that can always satisfy our hunger and our thirst than for that which could never quench the whole within us. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. We always know mercy is just as much a gift to be given as a gift that is also received. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. When we are pure in heart, we can be trusted more. People can come to us with their issues. We can be used as middlemen, right? Which goes along with blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be sons of God. When we focus on making peace with others instead of always fighting back, then we find that everyone wants to make peace with us when we want to make peace with others. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. We all have seen, just look through your history textbook. Those who have been persecuted, it leads to a stronger pushback. Persecution always forges the one persecuted in iron rather than destroying them and breaking them apart like pottery. As Jesus moves on into personal relationships in verse 21, the way that we ought to, uh, to have relationships with other people. Most of these are things that the world even agrees with. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. Let your, verse 37 even, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't live as an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You shall love your neighbor and love your enemy. When we live in these ways, we start to see the effects in our own lives. And we see that God, strangely enough, really knows what he's talking about. And so as we start experiencing life, as we start testing out the sense of different things, these things become apparent. How we ought to be, how we ought to live. Verse 15 of chapter 7, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many acts of miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. They never figured out how to clean themselves up. They smelled like they'd been rolling around in two-week-old pig's feet. How do we know what this smells like? We learn by reading God's Word. When we know what God's Word says, then we know what the truth really is. Sometimes we think, it's fine. And then God's sitting there, plugging His nose and saying, get out of my presence. I can't stand you being here. 
And the more and more we read our Bible, the more and more we learn how to cleanse ourselves. How to make ourselves smell better. How to make our aroma more pleasing to God. And that's not an easy task sometimes. In fact, perhaps most of the time, it's not a very easy task. Because going about our daily life, we attract smells and we attract dirt. And we need to clean that in some way. And it's no different with our spiritual life. As we go about our lives, sometimes we pick up on things that have attached themselves to our soul. But our reading of our Bible is what gives our soul that much-needed shower. However, when God searches for those who need Him most, He knows how to find them. He knows how to use His nose. Because He knows that those that sometimes smell the worst are the ones that need Him the most. He is always looking for us. And while this lesson was more intended to be a lesson for us to learn what that smells like and to stay away from it, Sometimes we can use our nose to find those who most need God. Be not deceived, my brethren. The people who live in opposition to this book are the ones who need God the most. And sometimes you're going to have to plug your nose to deal with them. But eventually they can learn. They can learn how to take a shower. They can learn how to clean themselves up. They can learn to use what only God can provide them. The soap and the scrubbers and the water of life. We need to know what this is like. We need to know what the rest of the world smells like. Because sometimes we have grown up thinking that some of the most putrid smells in this world are beautiful things. And instead of avoiding them, we try to bring them into our collection. We try to test if they're edible. And then we're surprised when we get sick. Ladies and gentlemen, the only way you're going to know what the difference is is by opening this book. This book will tell you what it really takes. This book will tell you what the truth of the matter really is. Sometimes that truth is a very hard-to-swallow pill. Or maybe it takes a little bit more scrubbing in the shower than we want. But it's all the better if you do. Because it doesn't matter whether or not anyone else finds your aroma appealing. It matters what God thinks about your aroma. Tonight, if you feel like you're having some trouble with that, perhaps maybe your spiritual nose isn't as attuned as you would like it to be, now is the time to do something about it. Sometimes we can gird up our our own loins and take care of it. And sometimes we need others' help. And whichever category you find yourself in, you've you've got an opportunity here tonight. Uh, But please don't allow your pride to push you away and make you take this journey on your own. We need to be helping each other. And so please take advantage of this opportunity. If, If you haven't ever taken a shower before, spiritually, Now is the time to do that as well. And you're going to find how much better it is when you step out of that bath and how much of your life is truly ahead of you. Whichever applies to you tonight, please take advantage of this opportunity as we stand and as we sing.